This morning we finish a a short four-week series in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, it's in the Old Testament. If you're new to the Bible uh, and can't find it, just look in the uh, table of contents, find the page number. The book of Ruth, four short chapters. Ruth chapter 4. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then we're going to pray together and ask God for His strength as we as we study this chapter together and close out our series. Starting in verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, please tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction One drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders uh, and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon. I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and, and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, and your house be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may His name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you uh, is more, more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women, women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father, father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Solomon. Solomon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Let's pray and ask God for his help as we study. Lord, we come before you recognizing that this is your word. This is given to us without error to strengthen us, to rebuke us to build us up, to edify us. God, I pray that you would do so this morning. I pray that you would help me as I communicate, that I would communicate not my own ideas, not my words, but that I would communicate your ideas, your word. Bless the hearers, God, that they might have ears to hear, a heart that is warm, soft, and open to your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to preach to you this morning on the title, Changing the Narrative. Changing the Narrative. Stories change us. 
I think of growing up, hearing the story on Christmas Day out of Luke chapter 2 of a little baby who was promised to a virgin. The virgin praising God with the fact that there's a baby in her womb. The baby who would be called Emmanuel, who would save his people from their sins. Shepherds in the field, a star in the sky, the the manger-born baby who's going to be the Savior of the world. He's going to change the world. I remember hearing that story, that story becoming so part of my own existence as a human being and what it means to live before the face of God. Stories change us. Now, about a thousand years or more, maybe 1,200 years, 1,300 years, we don't know exactly, there was another story of a baby born in Bethlehem. That's the story I just read to you. I imagine little boy and little girl in Israel, in the candlelight, little Johnny and little Sarah, being called by their parents to come and to listen to this story. Hear this story of this baby born in Bethlehem. It's a fun story to tell. The story of a baby born named Obed. His mother was Ruth. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. The story begins in a very sad state. The story begins with this woman, Naomi who's got a husband and she's got two boys and they are uh, in the middle of a famine in Bethlehem. They leave Bethlehem. They find themselves in the fields of a foreign land called Moab. There, her two boys meet some Moabite women and they get married. However, as the time goes on, Naomi loses her husband and she loses her two boys to death and she's left with one daughter-in-law named Ruth who chooses to cling to Naomi. This Moabite woman, Ruth, then travels with her widow uh, uh, mother-in-law back to her mother-in-law's hometown, a little town of Bethlehem. As they arrive back in town, Naomi is what? Come on, those of you that have been here tracking with this story. She's bitter. She says, don't even call me Naomi, call me Mara, for I'm bitter. God has left me empty. He's left me with nothing. She's upset. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is sort of a story of chance. But what we discover in chapter 2 is nothing really happens by chance. I'll just use my own story as an example. Is life a series of chance happenings? Well, it feels that way, doesn't it? Some people ask me, they say, Joel, did you always know that you were going to be a pastor in West Baltimore? Was that like your, did you just sit down one day and kind of figure this out? I'm like, nope, kind of feels like chance. Like I wouldn't have been in Baltimore had I not ended up at a church in Maryland called Greensboro Baptist Church. And I would have not uh, ended up at Greensboro Baptist Church if uh, Richard Parks had not met Dave Van Camp in 2002. And I would have not met Dave Van Camp to connect with the church in Greensboro, Maryland, had I not volunteered at Heritage Baptist Church Youth Group. And had I not uh, uh, met my wife, I would have never volunteered at Heritage Baptist Church Youth Group because I would have never got to Florida from Ohio because I was chasing a girl. (laughs) And I would have never met my wife had my brother never attended the school that she was part of. You see what I'm saying? Like, we go through life and things just kind of happen. As it so happened, I met this girl and went to Florida and felt like I needed to get a full-time job and moved to Maryland and ended up in Baltimore. But, but friends, is my life driven by just chance? Is our life a culmination of chance happenings? No. In all of our little mini stories, there is a grand story at work. God is doing something in my life, and God is doing something in your life. And what we see in the book of Ruth is that through ordinary means, God is doing something beautiful. 
And that applies to every single one of us today. This story, as it's told, has the power to change the hearer. And in chapter 2, as it so happens, Ruth ends up on the fields of Boaz. Now, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. We have to understand, according to the ancient customs, if a family were to fall into debt or owe some money, lose a field, or lose a husband, uh, which would culminate in everything else, uh, there was somebody in their family, in their clan, with a distant ancestor could purchase them out of slavery and keep their inheritance within the family. So, for example, let's just say, uh, Eric and Aisha, if you guys lost your home, all right, forbid it. Something happened and you lost your home. You're about to lose your home. It's in foreclosure. A, a family member, let's say Tim Carey comes along and he says, I will buy that. I'll pay that off so that it stays in the family, so that some wealthy person doesn't just come along and take it, and we've got to lose every. But it stays in the family, and it's now yours, and, and we can kind of keep on. That's, that's this picture of a kinsman redeemer, a close family member who can purchase you out of your problem. Now, this doesn't apply with the Tim Carey analogy, but let's just say that uh, there was also the death of a spouse the Redeemer could come along and marry the widow as a way to also propagate their family line to produce children for the family. The kinsman Redeemer opportunity was Boaz. And, and as story, the story goes, uh, as we get into chapter 3, uh, chapter 3 is this story of mystery. It all happens under the cover of night. And uh, Naomi has this idea, oh, go after Boaz. And, and Ruth goes to Boaz, but she says, hey, I don't want you just to marry me. I want you to be our redeemer. I want you to redeem the whole family. A bold move on Ruth's part. And as chapter three comes to a close, what we discover is good news. Boaz is going to see to it that she gets redeemed. However, there's a little hiccup you see, at this point in the story, we're all kind of like rooting for Boaz. Um, but Boaz says there's actually somebody else that can redeem you. There's another person that's closer in this family line of kinsman redeemership, and I need to first give him the opportunity, because Boaz is an honest man, as much as he might have wanted to marry Ruth, we don't know. He's an honest man, and he's got to give this other guy the opportunity first. And so that's where chapter 3 Ends. Now, where chapter 2 seems like chance, chapter 4 comes along, and it's clear decisions. Where chapter 3 seems to be secrecy, chapter 4 comes along, as, uh, along, and it's all decisions in public. It begins with Boaz at the town square, at the gate. This is the place where formal decisions are made, where property is exchanged, where they would uh, carry out any kind of uh, order of business for the town. Boaz is hanging out with his boys at the gate, and providence is still at work. Immediately, we assume this is probably the next morning, he sees the potential redeemer walking by. Oh, there's that young man. And he calls out to him. He says, hey, come on over here. Let's, let's chat. In verses 3 and 4, he says, all right, so here's the situation. Naomi, you've, you, know, you know of Naomi. Well, she's, she's selling this field. Uh, scholars believe that probably what's going on is that she's fallen into this debt. She's got to sell the field uh, in order to pay off the debts from losing her family and all this kind of stuff. Uh, she's selling, but better off, here's, here's what I want to propose to you, is, is that the, Naomi is uh, in your clan, and you are the closest to redeem Naomi. And so Boaz asks the young man, would you be willing to redeem Naomi? And, and also, by the way, it's pretty desperate. He says in verse 4, the situation is desperate. He says, uh, uh, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, let me know. Tell me. Because, here's why, there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. This is how desperate Naomi's situation is. There are only two 
possible redeemers. This young man and Boaz. If both of these redeemers say, no, we don't want to do this, well, her situation is back to hopelessness, back to square one, back to poverty, back to barrenness. Well, the man says, yeah, sounds good. I'll redeem it. Verse 4. Let's do it. Can't lose. And Boaz says, okay, but, (laughs) I haven't told you something. Um, If you redeem the land, if you redeem the property, part of the redemption is also taking Ruth the Moabite, he says, to be your wife to give them a family uh, inheritance of children. The nameless man says, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't tell me that at first. Hold up. I can't do that. And he goes on to explain that, that I, 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 I can't redeem it for myself. He says in verse 6, lest I impair my own inheritance. This could mean that he already has some children, and he doesn't want to bring on more children into his inheritance line so as to harm his children's uh, ability to, to get his whole inheritance. Or it could also mean that he's a little racist. This is a possibility that scholars put out there, that he doesn't want to take a Moabite woman, which I think is a pr- pretty good uh, uh, pretty good interpretation in that he clarifies that Ruth is a Moabite. I don't want to bring Moabite blood into my family inheritance. I don't want to mix with the Moabites. And so he gives up his right to the redemption. Boaz cannot redeem Ruth unless he has the right to do so. This nameless man gives up the right. You know, love is not self-seeking according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Love does not seek its own. This man is self-seeking. Boaz is not self-seeking. Because Boaz, throughout the entire story, has been looking to serve, not seek his own. And so at this moment, Boaz jumps at the opportunity that affords him. The man is nameless throughout the whole chapter. It's not because nobody knew his name, but it's because his name it doesn't deserve to go down in history. Because the name of Boaz will go down in history because he's this selfless, self-giving uh, individual character in the story who chooses to love Naomi and Ruth as their redeemer. So in verse 8, the nameless man takes off his sandal. I love these old customs. I wish we still did it, you know? Like if, hey, I'm going to buy that car. You can buy it. All right, here you go. Here's my, there's my Jordan. All right. Hey, give that back. That's a, it's a nice pair, but... Uh, you know, like, why don't we do that anymore? Um, I don't know why, but that was what they did. They gave their sandal as like a, a, you know, an official, like, hey, I can redeem you. I've got the sandal, you know. And, uh, and so Boaz now officially has the right to redeem. All right? Yeah. Track with me for a second. Your redeemer has to have the right to redeem you. You see where I'm going already? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Since we have flesh and blood shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death, Jesus took on flesh and blood. You see, church, you and I need our own stories rewritten. Uh, Naomi and Ruth, their story wasn't looking good. Their their narrative, if you just kind of tracked it out, it was a sad narrative all the way through, but God came in and kind of rewrote their narrative, all right? 
our story too needs to be rewritten because it starts off pretty sad. Our story starts off with a man named Adam sinning against God. Now, Adam was given life, but Adam's life was fickle. And uh, as a result of his fickleness, Adam uh, uh, sinned against God, incurred the curse against God, and all who come after him are not good people, but bad people. We are in our sin, naturally, and in our sin, we deserve the wrath of God. Let me just say this. If you don't believe that you deserve the eternal wrath of God, you have not made it to step one of Christianity. A Christian is someone who says, I am not a good person in church, but a Christian says, I am a very bad person, saved by grace, and so therefore I gather with other people who've been saved by the same grace to worship the Savior. Our story needs to be rewritten. Now, how does Jesus have the right to redeem us? Well, our sin is a human sin. So therefore, we need a human Savior. I don't think we too often realize how marvelous the baby in the manger actually is. The fact that God said, I am going to become human. I mean, like, the best novelist the world has ever seen could not think of this turn in the story. That the creator God would take on human flesh so that he might take on human sin. So that he might have the right to redeem us. Oh, and it's not just any... Any human that can die for another human. Because look, I'm a sinner. I cannot die for you. You put me on a cross, church. I'm dying for my own sin. The the great, most godliest person in the world at their death says, I deserve this because of my sin. You see, Jesus was not just any old human, though he was 100% human. But Jesus was also 100% divine. He remained God as he came into this world. Because our sin is not just a temporal, physical uh, mistake uh, that we've committed. But our sin is treason against an eternally holy God. And so therefore, only God can be the Redeemer for us in our sin. Ah, the God-man, Jesus Christ, 100% God and 100% human. How marvelous, church, is the manger scene, that baby in the manger who has the right to redeem. So my first point is simply this, the redemption right is his. Second point, redemption accomplished. Redemption accomplished accomplished. In verses 13 through 16, we see that Boaz, now that he has the right to redeem, he acts on that right, and he redeems. So starting off in verses 9 and 10, Boaz makes a public declaration in the town square at the gate, and he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to redeem her. I'm going to take her. He he uses all their formal names. Uh, It's a very formal sort of wording that he uses. Uh, There in uh, 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 verse 11 and 12, uh, the witnesses hear it and they respond in the affirmative. They respond with a blessing. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. Who were Rachel and Leah? They're the mothers of Israel. Uh, All the tribes of of Israel came through Rachel and Leah. So this is a, a blessing of fertility. May she have children. May she produce uh, a, a family line for you uh, that would be glorious and wonderful like Rachel and Leah. And then verse 12 is interesting. Verse 12, we actually learn something new about Boaz. Uh, they say, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you. Oh, wait a second, the reader says. Boaz is actually the descendant of Tamar. Who is Tamar? Well, she, she, she is a woman who, I don't have time to get into the whole story, just, just read it for yourself. 
She was taken advantage of over and over and over and over. She is someone who it looked as if she would have no children of her own. And it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't for the, the ridiculous wickedness of Judah, she would have never even got pregnant. But God blessed her womb. You see, God doesn't bless those who you think He might bless. But He often goes after the despised, the broken, the looked over, the forgotten, and He says, you're mine. You're mine. The womb of Tamar, His and they recognize this, I think. They see that Ruth has been the, the neglected, the forgotten, the unlikely. And God says, I want to bless Ruth. Verse 13, wedding bells and uh, the bedroom scene. Pretty clear there. <laughs> It's one of those verses you can only read once, <laughs> publicly. Um, and she gets pregnant, and they name the child Obed. And check this out, Naomi becomes the nanny. Isn't that fitting? Naomi, who lost her sons, uh, she's lost everything. She actually is able to be sort of this stepmother, the nanny, for, for little baby Obed. Look at verse 16. It says that Naomi, Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. What we see here, church, is that redemption has been accomplished. Boaz acted upon the right that he was given. The Redeemer has come. Redemption has been accomplished. Redemption has been accomplished. You are not waiting for your Redeemer any longer either. But the Redeemer has come. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, it says, we are justified by His grace as a gift through, listen to this, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that means wrath bearer, of his, by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over our former sins. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 goes on to say uh, that Jesus once and for all put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. What is redemption accomplished? It means this. Jesus first removes the wrath of God. The wrath that you and I deserve is removed by His act of propitiation, His act of taking on the judgment that we deserve, of dying in our place. But not only that, but it says that He separates our sin from us. In what way? Just a little bit? No, as far as the east is from the west. Well, that is like kind of a hard thing to measure. An immeasurable distance. Between you and your sin. Your sin defined you, church. Think about it. You're, you were wrapped up in your sin. You were driven down by the guilt of your sin. And it has been separated from you by an infinite measure. Sin weighed you down. But Jesus took the burden of your sin on Calvary. Guilt separated you from God, but Jesus was abandoned by the Father so that you might be reconciled with God. Shame caused you to hide your face from God, but Jesus was exposed. In your shame, He died so that you might stand in a loving relationship with God. The devil threatened to defeat you, but Jesus defeated the works of the devil so that you might stand. He's worthy, church. Oh, and by the way, his worthiness is seen. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move there real quick. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Amen? 
In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if he didn't rise from the dead, it's all worthless. Jesus rose from the dead. It's done. Redemption has been accomplished. You see, some people say, some people say, yeah, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for sinners. I agree. But sinners still need to find favor with God. Sinners still need to try to do some things to make things right with God. Well, let's pause. Is there a but after the statement, Jesus died for sinners? Jesus died for sinners, but no. There's a period right there, like a big full stop. Jesus died for sinners, period. How are you saved? Not by works of righteousness, because there's no amount of the debt that we can pay on our own. We need a redeemer to pay the whole thing for us. That's how it works. Oh, how are we uh, able to stand before God? Then how can we be saved from our sins? Because Jesus died for sinners, period. No debt I owe. There is no debt left for you to pay. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus died for sinners. So, church, application point. Stop living as if you're not redeemed. I see Christians so often walking around with their heads down, discouraged, frustrated, questioning life, questioning the goodness of God, questioning their future, wondering how things are going to turn out, filled with anxiety, filled with worry. Church, stop acting like you're not redeemed. Like you are redeemed. Redeemed. Well, you might act like you're not redeemed because you don't even know what redemption applied looks like in the believer's life. So let's talk about it. Redemption has been accomplished. What does it look like then for us to have redemption applied? Well, let's go back to the story of Ruth. For Ruth and Naomi, redemption applied looked like the fullness of life. Look at verse 14. The women, oh, let's pause right there. Where do we see women? the women first in the story? Do you remember chapter 1? As Naomi and Ruth come home, they're greeted by who in Bethlehem? The women. But in chapter 1, it's Naomi that speaks. In chapter 1, Naomi says, I don't even call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter because God has left me empty. My life is uh, a a waste. He's taken everything from me. He's destroyed everything about my life. He's brought calamity upon me. That's chapter 1. But now in chapter 4, the women speak. And it's a blessing on Naomi, but as I read it, I actually realize this is somewhat of a rebuke as well. It's like a rebuke-blessing. They say this. Look at verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you is more than seven sons has given birth to him. Line for line, there's a rebuke blessing. From the women to Naomi. So Naomi said, the Lord dealt bitterly with me. The women say, the Lord has not left you without a redeemer. Verse 14. Naomi said, my name is bitter. And the women say, may his name be renowned in Israel. Naomi said, I am empty. And the women say, he shall be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Naomi said, I've got nothing but calamity. And the women say, your daughter-in-law loves you more and is more of a blessing to you than not just two sons, but seven sons, which means as many sons as you can possibly have, Ruth is a greater 
blessing. It's a rebuke dash blessing. You see what I'm saying? What they're saying is, is stop living as if you are not redeemed. God rewrote your story. What you saw as calamity was God in the work rewriting a narrative, a grand, big picture narrative that brings your entire story together. And God is doing it for us, church, as well. What's your story? Like I said, it begins with Adam. Adam was fickle. Because of sin, Adam lost his life. Because Adam lost his life, every single person who comes after Adam has a life that is going to be terminated, ended, destruction, eternal hell. If there is any hope in our story, we need a second Adam. We need another representative for the human race. An Adam who isn't fickle. An Adam who, instead of giving us death, would give us life. As the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, goes. A verse that, unfortunately, we, we don't know much as a culture, but our church sings this verse loudly when we sing this song. It says, come desire of nations, come. Fix in us a humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now efface. Meaning, do away with it. Stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above. Reinstate us in thy love. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. What does redemption applied for us mean, church? It means the fullness of life. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, it says that in Christ you have the fullness of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. On the resurrection, says when Jesus rose, he rose as the life giving spirit. What does redemption applied mean for us today? It means that you have in Christ righteousness. You have been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And you say, Yes, but I still sin. And I say, But in Christ, you've got righteousness. Yes, in your flesh, you're still sinning, but in Christ, you're covered by His robe, by His righteous robe. In Christ, you have holiness. You are being changed. You're being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. He gives you new desires. He makes you into a new creation. In redemption applied, you have been purchased by Christ, which means He owns you. You're no longer owned by your desires. You're no longer owned by anybody in this world. You're no longer owned by the things of this world. But you are owned by Christ. And if you're owned by Christ, oh, He's going to take care of everything that He owns. See, church, too often these things are not good enough for us. Too often... We act like the uh, little toddler, the, the young child at Christmas time who opens up a gift and it's a teddy bear and he's so excited about the teddy bear and he loves it. And he gets a Lego set and he loves it. And then the big gift it comes along and it, his parents help him open it up and he pulls out this piece of paper. It's a $100,000 college savings bond. Ugh. What a waste of a gift. Does a four-year-old appreciate that? Would you? <laughs> but see, God is merciful to us like we are to children. Yeah, they don't appreciate it. But that's actually what they need. Does righteousness to you, does that feel like opening up a pair of socks on Christmas morning? Oh, wow. Wow. I thought you were going to give me some good news. Just a pair of socks. 
Nothing wrong with that. I just thought I was going to get something better. The saying that you have in Christ, holiness, does that feel like you just open up a package of fruit of the loom on Christmas morning? Like, are these just, you know, the side item gifts? Do Christians, when they hear the preacher say that in Christ you have righteousness, does that well something up in you, or do you say, yeah, 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 I know that, give me something more? When, when I say that in Christ you have the forgiveness of sins, does that make you want to dance, or does, uh, does that just make you say, yeah, I was taught that my whole life, give me, give me something else, I'm bored? If I were to say that in Christ you have holiness, does that excite you? Or, or do you say, well, eh, the things of the world seem more appealing? Church, these are the greatest gifts we can have. You know, uh, so often we, we hear it in Ephesians, it says that in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. And you know what we respond to that with? We say, yeah, but what about the physical blessings? As if the things of this world are more valuable than the spiritual blessings of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. Oh, church, you will one day have the physical blessings, but they are kept with God on high. You have today every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, which means there is nothing that Jesus has spiritually that you do not already have in Christ. Oh, and guess what? One day, Jesus is coming again to earth, and you will have the physical blessings of Jesus, a new world, a new earth. Oh yeah, the meek inherit all of that stuff. But church, you've got everything you need right now, because you have Jesus Christ. Have you come to Christ I could turn this around and I could say, do you have this? You're not born with it. You don't just naturally have it. You don't have it because you go to church. You don't have it because you just believe a couple things. You have it because you've been regenerated. You have it because you've been converted. Like the story that we heard this morning from Tajay. A conversion. A reception of God's grace. There's nothing you can do to, have, to, to earn it. You receive it. Church, I'm offering right now the gift of salvation. Receive it. I'm pleading with you, don't walk out of here and reject the gift of Jesus Christ this morning. He died for your sins, turn from your sins, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I imagine little Johnny and little Sarah a thousand or some years before the birth of Jesus in ancient Israel gathering around the candlelight with their mom and their dad, and they're hearing the story of this baby born in Bethlehem. And it's a fun story to tell, and, and I'm sure it was told over and over and over. It's a bedtime story. It's, let, mom, tell me the story of Ruth. Tell me the story of little baby Obed. Tell me the story of Naomi and this Boaz character. And like every good story... The storyteller saves the best for last. Look at verse 17. Here's the point of the story. You might have been wondering this entire time, this is a great story, wonderful. But how does it connect with the overall picture of what God is doing in the world? Verse 17. The women of the neighborhood gave him a son saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse. The father of David. And little Johnny and little Sarah say, ah, King David. We know David. This is a story of David's great-great-grandmother, or great-grandmother, Ruth. This is a story of David's grandfather. How This is the story of the royal lineage. This is a story of a woman who had nothing in this world, who was rejected in this world, who God blessed her womb and brought her into Israel from Moab, and God planted in her the seed of David. Now these are the generations 
of Perez, Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron, Ram, Ram fathered Abinadab, Abinadab, fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Sam, Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz is the seventh in the line there, which means that he's the, uh, uh, the star of the, the story. Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Oh, we got to go to Matthew chapter 1. Go to Matthew chapter 1 with me. Because the lineage goes on. You see, by the way, you guys know something about Ruth's life that she never knew. You know, like so often it's almost as if like, man, if I can't see the blessings physically played out right now in my life, then God's not doing anything. I don't think Ruth thought like that. She lived her whole life with this faithful existence. She never knew that she would be, her, her great-grandson would, would be King David. She never knew that uh, uh, through her line would come Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1. We see here a very long uh, lineage. Matthew goes through great pains to show us the lineage of Jesus. From Abraham to Perez to Ruth, right there in chapter five, uh, verse 5, Ruth makes it into the lineage, to David, to Uzziah, to Joseph, to Jesus. The woman who began with nothing is carrying the royal seed of the Messiah in her womb. The story of Jesus, that story changed my life. The story of this baby born in a manger who's come that man no more may die. Come to give us second birth. Come to raise the sons of earth. This baby born in the manger, he, he grew in stature and in wisdom. He was crucified on the cross on Mount Calvary. Took the judgment of God for our sin. He died that day. He was buried in a grave and for three days He laid in the earth. Now early one Sunday morning on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, defeating death, defeating the devil, defeating sin. He, then 40 days later, He rose up into the clouds and He ascended to be with the Father. And He is coming again. He's coming as our Lord and as our Savior to judge the world of, this, of its sin and to redeem uh, all who are in Him, to, to finally bring to consummation the promises of God for His people. That story has changed my life. That story has changed the lives of millions of people for 2,000 and some years. That story continues to change lives today. It's a story of salvation. It's a story of hope. It's a story of strength. Like none other, Jesus is our Savior. He is our story. Like none other, He is our salvation. Like none other, He is our strength. The strength like none other. He is our hope. A hope like no other church. This should well up in us. The same kind of excitement and desire to dance as the little children would have done in Bethlehem thousands of years before hearing the story of Ruth. It's the grand narrative that says God changes your story. And it's a good story. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are in control we thank you for the fact that nothing happens by chance. That you're working through us, in us, all of the time. And God, I pray that as we live our lives, that we would live with just a simple trust in what you're doing and that our story is indeed a good story because it is written by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.